Good morning. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the organizers uh, for inviting me and uh, putting together this, uh, this great conference. Today is the second conference uh, sort of along the uh, similar lines. So and I was thinking what I should talk about. I was a bit uh, sort of had a hard time deciding because 50 people moved from one conference to the other conference. So I either, I'm, uh, I'm going to repeat things that 50 people have heard or the other 150 people have not heard. So I'm not sure <laughs> what's the best solution here. So I'll do a little bit of um, repetition of things that I have talked about uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, but at least the first part of it is different. So you know you can fall asleep in, in about 20 minutes. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the history of biomagnetic measurements with atomic sensors, just to kind of see where it started and where we're going. And then try to sort of, in very broad strokes, summarize uh, some of the um, in the challenges that hopefully at this conference people will be talking about uh, that we can address. Uh, and then I'll focus more on scalar atomic magnetometers, uh, which, um, as I saw, actually historically have been used for this type of measurements, but recently most work had been done on, um, on vector magnetometers. But I think scalar magnetometers have some, some unique advantages for MEG, and so I'll talk about that, and I'll, I'll talk about the work that we're doing uh, uh, with the magnetometers and gradiometers. Then I'll, um, I'll go to slightly different topics and talk about RF magnetometers and also nuclear spin core magnetometers uh, for other people who might be interested in things besides MEG. Um, so the history of biomagnetic measurements with atomic magnetometers starts in the 70s, and so you can see this paper from Russia where they, they had a scalar gradiometer with a uh, six centimeter baseline, about 500 femtoslav sensitivity. And they were able to detect pretty much uh, in most of the kinds of biological signals we talk about now, except for the brain, perhaps. So they say in the papers that MEG was recorded sort of just at the noise level of the sensor. Uh, and then I guess nothing really was done for, for a long time until, uh, you know, much more recently, uh, uh, people started working uh, 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 on atomic magnetometers. Uh, so initially for MCG, and this is sort of the famous picture of mapping out the magnetic field of the heart. Also with a scalar sensor that had a noise level of about 100 femtoslav per square root of hertz. Um, so then uh, focusing specifically on MEG, uh, we started this work about 15 years ago now. Uh, and so this is the first system that we had built to detect MEG signals. And the sensitivity was pretty good. The spacing uh, probably was, uh, was relatively large. But still, you could see you know, sort of sizable size signals a couple hundred femtoslav. And then we sort of expanded the system uh, to make one big cell. And so this is the idea of, uh, uh, of getting many channels from just a single sensor, uh, which is relatively cheap and easy to get 100 channels or so, a signals of different magnitude from which you can um, uh, you know, localize the signal uh, at least to some extent. So the idea, once you have you know, a sampling of magnetic field of origin of the brain, uh, you can find the location of the dipole. And this was sort of the first demonstration of that basic idea. Uh, so then the work sort of moved towards the question of how you build small magnetometers, because that gives you more flexibility uh, and also uh, closer distance to the brain. And so we worked on this for a little bit, too. Uh, this is the data from Biomac 2012. Uh, but, but now this has actually moved much further in several companies that I guess we'll hear about uh, at this meeting uh, uh, who are doing much better. But still, there is sort of a bigger um, you know, issue of, of, of sort of the mass of cables you have to deal with when you have a lot of, uh, of channels and just the robustness to, uh, and reliability of the system. So I would say that's sort of one of the challenges which is currently being solved. Uh, and I'm sure it will be you know, solved pretty much in a couple of years. Uh, so then the question is, from the point of view of, uh, of atomic energy, what can we do better than a squid? Uh, and so something that already have been discussed and will be discussed at this conference is flexibility of place in the sensors, uh, in, 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 uh, different place allowing the subject to move. Uh, so th these are already um, improvements in that direction. If I can make very small sensors with high sensitivity and at least there is potential uh, with magnetometers to get sensitivity of femtotesla, uh, unless you can get much higher spatial resolution and sensitivity, and so this is something that continuously will get improved, uh, you know, uh, are refining the techniques. Uh, and then, um, so the thing that I will talk about mostly, which is kind of still a dream, is operating in an unshielded environment. So 
as far as I know, no one had attracted to MIG without a magnetic shield, and certainly people in the squid world have tried this for, uh, for a number of years using various constellation schemes. And so the question is, can we do something with atomic magnetometers that people haven't been able to do with squids? So that sort of uh, is the focus uh, of, um, of my discussion today. And then eventually, hopefully, one could get to a point of having low cost of these systems. And I would say that each sensor itself is not necessarily any cheaper than a squid. But if you can get rid of the crest and if you can get rid of the magnetic shield, those actually are the major sources of cost. So if you just have the sensors, then the cost will be substantially low, and you can sort of decide how many sensors you want, whereas for these other things, you have just one big uh, uh, you know, object. So uh, if you think about current uh, ways of detecting MEG, you know, we can talk about surf sensors, we can talk about squids. They are, uh, uh, um, uh, at the basic level, is a vector sensor. So it matters one, uh, one vector component of magnetic field. Uh, and so that uh, uh, imposes some limitations. Uh, in particular, if you measure any voltage, it's hard to get very high dynamic range. And even if somehow your sensor uh, managed to get very high dynamic range, it's hard to even record it and digitize it. So the best ADC you can get will have a dynamic range of something like 310 to the 8, which is still not quite enough uh, if you measure any voltage. So uh, th th that's sort of one fundamental limitation of any kind of sensor, which is a vector sensor. The other limitation is that each sensor requires calibration. There's not, uh, nothing fundamental about it. Um, and then if it's rotated in a magnetic field by some angle, th then you pick up a lot of noise. So uh, all these are sort of general limitations of the sensors that people have been using for MEG so far. And so the question is, if, if we go to a slightly different type of sensor, uh, we can maybe do better. And so, um, with atomic magnetometers, luckily you have a choice of three different types of, uh, of operating modes you can choose. It was virtually the same hardware, so the same sensor can sometimes be used for all of them. And so, um, you know, traditionally people have thinking about the vector sensor or the surf sensor as the most sensitive one. Uh, but actually, in the other modes of operation, we can also get similar levels of sensitivity. Uh, under ideal conditions, it's less than a femtotesla. With a scalar sensor, uh, where you measure the absolute frequency of spin precession, you have to work a little bit harder, but you can still get to that level. And so because, uh, because it's a scalar sensor, the two key points are that it's insensitive to orientation in the magnetic field, at least to first order, and you're measuring frequency and not voltage. And so whereas um, voltage, it's very hard to measure to, a, to you know, one part and 10 to the 9, Frequency, it's trivial to measure to one part in 10 to the 10 or 11 uh, if you have a reference. So uh, this is the main difference compared with um, in all the other modes uh, of operation uh, of a magnetometer. And so recently, we've been working on one particular implementation of a scalar sensor, uh, trying to move from, uh, from a big system inside magnetic shields to something you can move around. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the, the beginnings of it, uh, and then I think in the afternoon, Tom Cornock will talk about sort of the practical implementation of it and what you can do with it out of the lab. Um, the basic idea of it is very simple and sort of there's nothing particularly clever about it. So you, you just have a pulse laser uh, that polarizes the spins uh, 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 by uh, t t turning the laser on for a very short time. And then the spin spreads for a few milliseconds, depending on the T2. And then you just repeat this process many, many times. And so your signal looks like this. It's just a bunch of decayed signals. And if you zoom in on one of those, you, you just have a perfect sine wave. So you can measure the frequency of the sine wave the best you can. And then in this particular implementation, we're looking at the top and the bottom of the cell uh, uh, so that it's a gradiometer and we can subtract common mode noise. Uh, and so the sensitivity that we got in this case uh, is about 14 from to Tesla. So that by itself is not particularly remarkable. But the nice thing about it is that it extends over uh, a frequency range uh, f from a very low field up to Earth's field. So this is sort of a spectrum at different magnetic fields. It looks virtually identical, and the sensitivity remains constant uh, up to the value uh, uh, of uh, Earth's field. Also, we operate the cell at relatively low temperature, and so that's uh, you know, practically advantageous. You know, the basic trick here, which I'll talk about later, is that we have a multi-pass cell, so the probe beam uh, is somehow passing through the cell multiple times, and that's what, what gives us a little bit extra signal. Uh, 
so uh, the other big question that, uh, that uh, one has to worry about if you're building a gradiometer, uh, the basic question of how well does the gradiometer work. And, and the measure of the performance for a gradiometer is a common moderate junction ratio. So if I apply a uniform field, then it should cancel between the two channels. Uh, and uh, to the extent to which it cancels uh, is you know, the crucial aspect uh, of why you would want the gradiometer. So you would want to have uh, 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 this ratio as high as possible. Uh, now, if you're talking about, let's say, a squid sensor or a surf sensor, uh, because the calibration of the two uh, sensors is sort of arbitrary, there's nothing uh, particularly special about it. So you have to measure two uh, sensitivities and then subtract them and somehow match them precisely. Uh, but in the case of a scalar sensor, the calibration constant is a Bohr magnetron of the electron, which is the same in the two halves of the cell. So you don't actually have to do anything. You simply subtract two frequencies, and you can get very good uh, uh, suppression ratio. And this applies in all three directions. So you can apply the field in three directions, and you get uh, uh, the number which is uh, very similar to this. So uh, uh, this is sort of the key advantage of uh, a scalar magnetometer, that each sensor is identical and so you can subtract them much better, at least if they're you know, in a field that's pointing in the same direction. One of the issues comes up is if you have a gradient, then the two sensors can be measured in field in a slightly different direction. But that sort of is a high order effect. Um, and so the question then is, OK, suppose you have the sensor. What would happen if you operate in an unshielded environment? Uh, you know, uh, sort of how far do you have to suppress noise? And so one of the things we did a couple of years ago is just to take one of these sensors and just put it in the lab on the optical table without any shields and see how bad they would be. And so you can operate them uh, you know, in the same way, uh, unshielded, and you get the same kinds of signals. Uh, the only difference is that now if you look at the frequencies, they oscillate. And so this is 60 hertz uh, in the two channels. So you can see that that's a very big modulation, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost 100 nanotesla. Uh, if you look at the difference of these two signals, you get something that looks like this. So it still has some spikes in it and some modulation. And one of the questions that one would have to figure out is whether what you see here is because um, an imperfect cancellation of the two sensors or because you have a real gradient uh, uh, of 60 hertz and other kinds of noise sources. And so eventually, you could probably use two uh, of these gradiometers to sort of, um, you know, basically build a high, uh, uh, you know, high order suppression. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, also very easily is just use a flux gate to measure the magnetic field noise in different components. One thing that was sort of interesting, and I didn't expect to have such a big difference, if you uh, actually look at the different components of magnetic field, the vertical component is much noisier than the horizontal components. And that's because all the wires are running horizontally and they create creating fields which are vertical. So the magnetic noise uh, uh, you know, is much bigger in the vertical direction than in the horizontal direction. Now, when you have a scalar sense, you don't get, um, actually get to choose what you measure. You measure along the magnetic field. So it's kind of at 45 degrees. But still, this is an interesting way to look at it. And so if you just look at white noise, you see that the best you can hope for is something like 10 picotesla, or maybe 100 picotesla. So what we need is a suppression uh, uh, you know, of all this broadband noise by something like 10 to the 3 to, uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to even higher, 10 to the 5, uh, so that we can get to the noise level of a few femtotesla uh, for MEG. Uh, and so that sort of is a challenge. You know, can we build uh, in a system with this suppression factor for all directions? And as I showed you before, with our sensor, we're actually pretty close. We're already at 10 to the 4. So that basically shows the premise uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of using a scalar sensor for detection of MEG in an unshielded environment. Uh, so this, this next question you can ask is, well, can you do better, right? So, you know, we're at like 14 femtotesla, and usually like to be at one femtotesla below. So, uh, you know, what can we do to improve the sensor? So we looked at the fundamental noise sources. So if you look at the spectrum of the noise, uh, the, 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 that is coming out of the polarimeter, you get something that looks like this. So, the, uh, so this is spin noise. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's quantum fluctuations of the spin, and this is photon shot noise. So all of the limitations of the noise is quantum in this case. Um, so that's good and bad, because first it means the sensor operates pretty much as well as it could, but it also is telling that you have to somehow fundamentally change its operation to do much better. And so this is a comparison 
uh, of the experimental measurements of the noise as a function of fitting time uh, in, uh, 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 of the signal uh, in comparison with the model. And so you can see it's following, um, you know, very closely. So uh, we're basically at the limit um, and our optical rotation signal that we get is very close to pi over 4. So it's basically a sine wave as big as you can get. And the power that we use for the probe laser is a Vixel, uh, uh, so it's about 400 microwatt, which is also almost as high of a power from a Vixel that you can get. And so we're basically at a, at a fundamental limit that if I measure a sine wave uh, you know, with light and you have this much power, um, then there's limit on the frequency insurance. It doesn't matter how your sensor operates. It's just if you have optical readout, it's going to have photon shot noise at very least. And so this would be the limit. So uh, if you wanted to improve the sensitivity, you can is increase the probe power, which in principle you can do, but then you have to use a DBR laser and the system becomes much uh, expensive you know, and more bulky. Uh, or you have to do something else. And so the thing that we can do is to wrap the signal. And what I mean by wrapping the signal is that we are increasing the amplitude uh, of the rotation bigger than pi over 4. Uh, and then the signal starts to look like this. So instead of just being a sine wave, when the polarization rotation exceeds pi over 4, you start uh, um, getting these dips. And then if you increase it even more, it starts to look like this. So this is still an exponential decay of the spin, uh, but, but in this region here, the signal is wrapped around multiple times. And mathematically, you can write it by this function. Basically, this is a precession of the spin, and this is output of the polarimeter. So it's a sine of a sine, and you know, that uh, you know, you know, will give you these shapes fairly close. Uh, and because we use multi-pass cells, it's fairly easy to get to this regime. You just have to use increase the temperature a little bit, uh, you know, or tune the laser closer to resonance. And so this allows you to break this limit uh, because your amplitude is effectively bigger than one. So you can imagine unwrapping the signal, but as far as the zero crossings are concerned here, you effectively have a larger amplitude bigger than one. Or if, if you have multiple wraps, you also have multiple zero crossings. And so your measurement happens at several times with, uh, with each zero crossing. So uh, basically with these methods, you can make the sensitivity much better than what this, uh, this calculation will give you for just a sine wave. Now, it also makes the signal analysis more complicated. Uh, and so that's something that we're working on. But that's basically the way to do better and to eventually get to sort of femtotesla or sub femtotesla sensitivity without increasing the power of the laser. Now, something else you can try to do is if you're looking at the gradient, you can try to measure the gradient directly. And so a, a, a simple way of doing it is to have two cells uh, 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 and the probe laser uh, is passing through one cell and then passing through the other cell. And if you arrange the polarizations of the two cells to be opposite, then the signals will subtract. Uh, and now the key point here is that they subtract inside the sine wave. Uh, uh, so it's not a difference of just two voltages, it's a difference of two optical rotations. So you can only do this optically. But then if you just look at this, uh, 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 you can write it in this form. And so what you see is, is a precession at the lambda frequency and something that goes as a difference of the two frequencies. And so this is the way that you can make a gradiometer, uh, which is basically dependent on the difference in the two frequencies of the two cells. Um, now, if you're looking at the gradient, which is relatively small, you will often operate in the regime where this combination of parameters uh, is much smaller than one. So basically, the sign is increasing linearly uh, in, in time without turning over. And so uh, in this case, you don't actually get oscillations or beats uh, but what you get is a signal that kind of looks like this. So it basically uh, it grows linearly and then exponential decay takes over. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is that now the amplitude of the signal is proportional to the gradient. So if everything is perfectly matched, the signal would be zero. Uh, and so uh, what we're looking at here is the amplitude of the signal as a function of gradient. So simply fitting this or just looking at its amplitude gives you the measure of the gradient. And you can see, uh, see it's linear. Uh, to uh, high accuracy. So this is a different way of measuring gradient where you're measuring it directly um, uh, uh, and looking at the amplitude of the signal instead of the frequency of the signal. Uh, 
Uh, now, there is also some challenges with this, as you can imagine, if these two amplitudes are not exactly the same, then the signals will not cancel perfectly, and if they have different coherence times, it gets a little bit more complicated as well. So uh, we're working right now on sort of to improve this mass of the sensitivity of what we have obtained so far is about 20 femtoscopes per square root of hertz. So we still have some ways to go, but that's uh, one possible way uh, uh, you know, uh, of simplifying the signal and only looking at the amplitude of this, uh, of this transient. So now we'll talk about something slightly different. Uh, for a number of years, we've been working also uh, on RF magnetometers. The basic idea of an RF magnetometer is that you have uh, a magnetic field uh, and a pump laser which are parallel to each other and the probe laser which is perpendicular to it, then I if you apply uh, um, an RF field which is very weak, it will excite the spins by very small amounts, so they're processed by a small angle here, and then you can measure it with the probe beam. And so this is an interesting uh, way of looking for you know, very weak RF signals or for NMR or MQR signals. And we have played uh, with various ways of doing it. For example, you can use a multi-pass cell like this, where there's two mirrors, uh, and the light is bouncing back and forth 50 times between these mirrors. And so the cell is, uh, is small, but it, uh, but it also gives you high sensitivity. Uh, um, um, it's because of the multi-pass arrangement again. Uh, and so for an RF magnetometer, you can also arrange the system uh, in of canceling uh, of canceling the signal uh, by looking at two cells with opposite polarization. And this actually works very well because in this case you don't have to cancel a very large signal. You start uh, with basically zero signal and what you get is something on the order of a, a fraction of a femtotesla. And so that's another you know, application of these techniques to RF magnetometry. So in the remaining five minutes I'll talk about something else uh, which is how to use alkyl metal um, for a co-magnetometer, nuclear spin co-magnetometer. Uh, and the basic idea is that if we want to look at precession of nuclear spins, we can do the same trick. We can apply pi over two pulse, let them precess, and measure the frequency of that precession. Now, the difficulty that you want to measure this precession very precisely, and the presence of alkali metal uh, is actually affecting the frequency. So what we do is we turn off all the lasers in the middle, so rubidium is unpolarized and in fact we drive it to zero polarization in some active way. Uh, so we measure the phase of the signal here and the phase of the signal here, uh, and then uh, from the difference in time here we can find the frequency. Uh, uh, one of the questions is uh, you know, how do you operate the magnetometer to get the signal, uh, you know, to get a signal that's very high. Turns out uh, that's actually putting it a little bit uh, outside of the surf regime. Uh, and, and so there's a couple of tricks of doing it, uh, you know, with some decoupling pulses. Uh, so the next question is how stable this measurement would be. And so this is all variation of it, uh, uh, you know, which looks pretty nice uh, for a few hours. Uh, but to get this, you have to understand all kinds of imperfections of the pi pulses and the cell shape and so on. Our goal in this measurement uh, was to tell if the Earth is rotating. Well, we, we know it's rotating. Uh, but want to know precisely how much it rotates without having to flip anything. And so uh, if you know all the numbers here precisely, you can just calculate what is the rotation of the Earth without any free parameters. And you can see, you know, it fits relatively well. And this is the Earth rotating in the other direction. Well, it's actually the magnetometer is flipped over. But the basic idea is that it works with sufficient precision, at least at that level. Um, now, we can do a little bit better with near now. And so with near, the coherence time is longer. And one of the surprises uh, we discovered is that uh, the, 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 there's not oscillations like this, which is caused by a quadrupolar interaction with the wall. In our cells, we just get exponential decay. And so we can do the same trick and get on variance uh, that is already better than what we can do with xenon. And hopefully, we'll get even better uh, as we're improving the system. Um, so the other thing we discovered is that uh, we can make cells with coherence times uh, which are very long, about 300 seconds, with these very small cells. So if you like something like this, you can talk with Tom uh, 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 about how to make these cells. Uh, we also try to understand what happens when two atoms collide, uh, the nuclear spins of two atoms interact. It seems like it should be simple, but there's been some confusion in the past on this topic. And so the bottom line is that you get some uh, interaction which is weak, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but it's not exactly zero. So 
If you have questions about this, we can talk later. I'm running out of time. Um, so uh, the basic overall conclusion is that atomic magnetometers now are competitive with squids uh, and are starting to sort of approach in the direction uh, and the development of practical aspects is moving very fast. So we need to think beyond that and think about what uh, 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 unique things that atomic magnetometers can do. And so a scalar magnetometer is such a unique sensor with very high dynamic range and possibility of one shield operation. So if we can get that work, I think that would be sort of you know, a step forward in MEG. Thank you.